Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you all again, and uh, great to see so many of you back in the building. If you've been away in uh, ISO or quarantine or traveling or, well, for whatever reason, not with us, uh, it's so good to see you again. Good to see your beautiful faces, or at least the top half of your beautiful faces. But uh, wonderful to know that you were able to at least join us online. If you have been joining us online, and for those joining us online right now, great to have you with us as we wrap up what has been a remarkable series, a really wonderful series in the book of Galatians. I've thoroughly enjoyed every part of it. And the truth of the matter is, it's a very important conversation that we've been having. Because if you get the gospel wrong, you get so many other things about faith and following Jesus wrong. So it really is foundational in that sense and has been a really worthwhile conversation. And so today, to... uh, Get us going in this fourth and final installment. I want to share two verses of Scripture with you from Galatians chapter 5. So we'll read verse 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your liberty to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Right now here in this little passage that we've just read together, uh, this is one of those uh, few but important summative statements in Galatians. In other words, Paul is using the opportunity here to sum up the entire letter as a whole. And you'll notice that there are three really important things that he identifies here. Law, liberty, and love. Law, liberty, and love. Those are the three primary themes in the book of Galatians. And the book is about the relationship between those three and about the journey that takes place as we move from one to the other. And so I want to take a moment just to unpack that journey with you. And if you're in the room, you can follow on screen behind me. And if you're online, just listen very closely. But really where we start out is under the element of the law. And of course, by law, we mean the written, codified uh, rule and regulation that was penned by Moses and given to Israel and is recorded for us in the first five books of the Old Testament. And you see, back in the Old Testament period, before Jesus came on the scene, if you wanted to be part of the covenant grouping of God's people, if you wanted to be in relationship with God, if you wanted to be one of those unique people who had responsibility to represent God on earth, you had to be Jewish, right? The nation of Israel was God's representative people on earth. They had covenant relationship with him, and they had an associated responsibility to represent him in this world. And if you wanted to be part of that, you had to convert to Judaism, and you had to become a Jew, and that meant bringing your life under the law. Now, the law was not a bad thing. In fact, when Paul describes the law in Romans 7 verse 12, he says the law was good and righteous and and holy. In, In other words, Paul saw the law as something positive, not something negative, and it's important for us to note that because very often in the context of Christian faith, we think of the law in negative terms. We associate it with oppression and bondage, and so we, we, we put all these negative connotations on it. But in the heart and mind of Paul, the law was good, and it was holy, and it was just. Those are the adjectives that he used to describe it. The law was not bad, but the law was limited in purpose. There were certain things that the law just simply could not do. Like the law could not make us righteous before God. And the law could not adequately deal with the problem of sin in the human heart. The law was like incapable of uh, transforming the human heart. And it was even incapable of restraining the hand. In other words, the law was not uh, effective in dealing with the problem of sin and its impact on the will. You see, I, I could make a law, decree a law that thou shalt not murder But that law has no power to stop you from murdering. At best, it's a deterrent. Or maybe even more accurately, it's the fear of the consequence of breaking that law that could potentially be a deterrent. But the law itself has no power to stop you murdering. You can go and commit murder and do it for as long as you like until you get caught. Meaning that the law only really comes into effect after the crime has been committed. After the sin has been enacted. So the law was limited in its power and limited in its purpose. So, of course, the obvious question then becomes, well, why did God give the law? Like, what's the point? Why did God um, give this law to Israel? And, And Paul explains the answer in Romans and in Galatians, and he sums it up by saying, well, the law really was given for three reasons. Number one, the law was given to reveal the presence of sin in us. We would not have known our own brokenness if it were not for the law. 
We would not have known that murder and stealing and, and, and covetousness and adultery were wrong unless the law had spelt it out for us. And so we discover the presence of sin in our own hearts through the law. Paul says we also discover the righteousness of God. We, we learn that God is holy and just, and God has an ethical and a moral framework by which He exists and by which He lives and by which He expects His people to live. And so we discover the righteousness of God in the law. And then thirdly, Paul says that the law is kind of like a tutor, kind of like a guardian, maybe a nanny. Uh, and, and the law has the responsibility of taking us by the hand and leading us to the person of Jesus. And he says in Galatians 4, once the law has done that and taken us and guided us and led us to Jesus, having exposed the brokenness and sinfulness in our own hearts, having revealed the righteousness of God, once it hands us over to Jesus, it has served its purpose. It's done. Right? And of course, we know that when Jesus did eventually arrive on the scene, he said, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and then to replace it. To usher in a new covenant, a new way of relating to God, not on the basis of keeping the law, but on the basis of grace and faith. And Jesus said, the wonderful thing is that this new covenant is now available to everybody. You no longer have to be Jewish. You no longer have to be circumcised. You no longer have to observe feasts and festivals. You don't have to observe the law. The basis of this covenant is His own personal sacrifice. He sealed it and marked it with his own blood. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus opened up a brand new way for humanity to enter into relationship with God. And he said, everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome. And so when that happens, when, when Jesus arrives on the scene and announces this new covenant and announces the grace of God available to all, what that does, that saving grace, is it brings us out from under the law and it brings us into something that Paul calls liberty. Christian freedom. It frees us from what? Well, from the obligation to keep the law. It frees us from the demands and the dictates of the law. It frees us from all the prohibitions and the prescriptions and the rules and the regulations that govern life under the law. And when you come into this glorious, liberating thing called Christian freedom, you are truly and wonderfully free. Free from all those expectations and those obligations. Free from all those restrictions and those limitations. You are free. Free to worship God on any particular day of the week. Free to eat whatever you want. Free to associate with whoever you want to associate with. You are just gloriously and wonderfully free. Now, you can imagine, on the one hand, this thing called Christian liberty would be incredibly, well, liberating. But on the other hand, it would be quite confronting. And quite unsettling. Imagine for a moment that you were a Jewish person and you had spent your entire life being told the law, the law, the law, the law. If you want to honor God, you've got to keep the law. If you want to be right with God, you've got to keep the law. If you want to represent Him faithfully, you've got to keep the law. You've got to keep the law. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along as God's new mediator between Himself and humanity. And Jesus announces a new covenant and He says, There's a new way and it's a way of faith and a way of grace, and you no longer have to follow the law. Well, that would be incredibly confronting. Like as a Jewish person, you'd be sitting there thinking to yourself, hold on a second, so you're telling me like I no longer have to keep the Sabbath? Yeah, yeah, you're free. You have no obligation anymore to keep the Sabbath. And, and do you mean that I no longer have to bring like sacrifices and offerings to the temple? Yeah, you're free, it's over. Jesus made the ultimate final sacrifice by giving his own life on the cross of Calvary once for all, for everyone. Sacrifices are no longer required. Wow. All right, so are you telling me like I don't have to bring the first 10% of my income to the temple and I don't have to give the first 10% of my harvest and my livestock and all my increase? Yeah, yeah, you're free. You are free from that obligation. You no longer have to do it. Wow, right? You are free to associate with people that previously the law said you could not associate with. You are free to wear clothes that previously the law said you could not wear. You're free to travel on the Sabbath, you're free to worship God on any day of the week. You are gloriously and wonderfully free. Hey, you want to have bacon on your burger? You have bacon on your burger. You're free, right? Under the law, no bacon on your burger, right? It's not on the menu. But now that you're out from under the law, you can have double cheese and bacon on every burger you like for the rest of your life, all right? Free, glorious freedom. So on the one hand, that's incredibly liberating. On the other hand, it's quite, it's quite disconcerting because we're not used to that level of freedom right? And, and Paul kind of gives us a word of caution. He says, you know what? Un under the law, there's a danger. As good as the law is, there's a danger. And that danger is falling into the trap of legalism. 
And legalism is when you try to fulfill the obligations and demands of the law, and, and you, you pursue a strict observance of the law in a really cold, clinical, dispassionate, heartless, soulless kind of way without any real regard for the God who gave the law or any love for the God who gave the law. And, and, and it all becomes about observing the law. And we see this happen in the Gospels, in, in the, the, the lives of the Pharisees and the Jewish religious leaders who, who lived in Jesus' time. They had fallen into this trap of legalism. So they had this very strict, very harsh, very cold, clinical, kind of cerebral, soulless commitment to observing the law, but they had no real love for the God who gave the law. And they thought that they could make themselves right with God by keeping the law. That's legalism. And there's a danger in life under the law that you can fall into the trap of legalism. Well, there's an equal danger when you come into this wonderful, glorious expression of Christian liberty or Christian freedom. And that danger is that the pendulum can swing all the way to the other side. And you can end up taking this newfound freedom and you can use it to indulge yourself and to serve yourself. And so Paul says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use this newfound freedom that you have in Christ to eat what you want and wear what you want and worship when you want and go wherever you want and associate with whoever you want. Don't use this newfound freedom to indulge yourself, to serve yourself, to become self-interested. He says there's a better way. There's a higher way. And it's what he calls the way of love. It's the Jesus way. Right? He says, glorious Christian freedom, as wonderful as it is, is not the ultimate destination of the, of the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is ultimately leading us through this wonderful experience of liberty to the place of love. Where our lives are regulated and guided and fueled and motivated by something internal, something deep. Not an external code of conduct, but an internal transformation of the heart that finds expression as love. And so he says in Galatians 5 verse 13, don't use this liberty to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. Why? Because that is the Jesus way. Right? When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment of all? He said, well, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are fulfilled in these two commands. Right? He said to his disciples just prior to his ascension, he said, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another the way I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, by the way that you love one another. This is the ultimate destination of the gospel of grace, to transform us from the inside out, to turn our lives right side up and, and, and inside out, and to make us a people who are fueled and motivated and empowered and guided by the love of God that we ourselves have received. And so Paul says something quite striking, something quite confronting in Galatians 5 or 6. He says, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself as love. My gosh, Paul, are you kidding? Like, do you mean that seriously? Like the only thing? The only thing that God is concerned about, the only thing that matters to him? Is faith in Jesus outworking itself as love? Yes. That is where God is ultimately leading all of us, to a life of love outworked in this world on the basis of our faith in Jesus. And so the question then becomes, okay, well, what does this life of love look like then? If this is ultimately where God is leading us and ultimately what the gospel of grace produces in us, what does love in action look like? And you know what I love so much about the Apostle Paul is, while he certainly has you know, profound insight and revelation into the nature of God and the kingdom of God, and he has some of the most profound and wonderful things to say, theologically speaking, Paul is also intensely practical. And in almost every book that you read that Paul wrote in the New Testament, you know, he'll spend probably the first half of the book talking about all the theology and the revelation and the doctrine and the insight that he has. And then about halfway through the book, he changes gears and he shifts over into a really practical application. And that's exactly what he does in the final part of Galatians. And so in Galatians chapter 6, he gives us several examples of what this life of love in action looks like. And I want to share some of them with you because they are so intensely practical and so helpful. So he's Says, number one, all right, the first thing is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, that love is expressed as concern for the spiritual well-being of others. Love is expressed as concern for the spiritual well-being of others. Verse 1 of Galatians 6, he says, brothers, 
and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Right? Paul's saying, if I see somebody far from God, if I see somebody maybe wandering down the path of licentiousness and self-indulgence, if I see somebody trapped in like self-defeating and, and, and self-limiting um, behaviors and habits of, of sin, if I see somebody maybe even wandering back under the Lord, trying to, trying to impress God with their ability to keep rules and regulations, if I see somebody struggling spiritually, then you know what the love of God does? It moves me and it compels me to say something and to do something. When I'm moved by the love of God, I'm not only concerned about my own spiritual journey. I'm concerned about... Struggling with habits that are not serving you well. What can I do to help how can I support you? How can I be there for you? How can I pray for you? I'm not going to leave you in your sin. I'm not going to leave you in your brokenness and your struggle. If the love of God is inside of my heart, it's going to compel me to become my brother's keeper and to look out for you as much as I look out for me. So that's the first thing. Paul says, love is concern for the spiritual well-being of others. Then he goes on to say in Galatians 6 verse 2 that love is also expressed as lending a helping hand in time of need. So in verse 2 of Galatians 6, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. You know, just the week before this, uh, my family and I were in quarantine because we got COVID, and uh, it, it hit us pretty badly. We were like symptomatic for six days, flat on our backs for most of it. It was a pretty rough week. But what was absolutely wonderful was we had so many people just reach out to us unexpectedly to say, what can we do to help? But we had people go out and buy groceries and come drop groceries off at our house. We had people send us uh, boxes of Krispy Kremes. We had two dozen boxes of Krispy Kremes arrived. So I'm like, what are we going to do with two dozen boxes of Krispy Kremes? Uh, people brought us care packages. People brought us um, Uber Eats vouchers. We were just so incredibly loved and supported. And you know what was wonderful about it was that expression of love eased our burden. It made our load a little lighter in that season. It took the weight off of our shoulders when we were not able to carry that weight ourselves. And that is what love does. Love eases other people's burdens. Love helps to lighten other people's loads. And it's as simple as, you know, helping the little old lady cross the street when she can't get across by herself. It's sending your friends in quarantine groceries. It's offering to pick up your friend's kids from school when he or she is running late. It's washing somebody's car for them. There were just a million and one practical, helpful demonstrations of care and concern and help in time of need that you and I get to show. And you know what I love about this? I love the fact that you don't have to have a theology, in, a, a, a degree in theology to be an agent of God's love, right? You don't have to be so spiritual that you glow in the dark, right? You don't have to know it all. You just have to have a willing heart. That's how accessible this is, right? That's how simple this is. But this is where God wants us to go, and this is how God wants us to live. So love is lending a helping hand in time of need, and that's something we can all do. Thirdly, Paul says, love is accepting and fulfilling your responsibility. In verse 4 to 5 of Galatians 6, he says, Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. In other words, Paul is saying just keep an eye on your own motives and, and check your own heart. Don't compare yourself with other people in this journey of faith. Take responsibility for your own life. And he says, for each one should carry their own load. And that word load in the original Greek is a, a military word that was used to refer to the uh, equipment that soldiers would carry. And so it carries that connotation of responsibility because each soldier is responsible for his own equipment. And so Paul's saying you need to take responsibility for what only you can take responsibility for. And whether you are a husband or wife or a father or mother or employer or employee, uh, whatever vocation or station in life you find yourself, you have responsibilities. And you've got to ask yourself the question, what am I responsible for? And who am I responsible for? And then I need to embrace those responsibilities. Why? Because to do so is an act of love. And to not do so is an incredibly unloving thing. You see, when I neglect my responsibilities, 
whether that's as a husband or a father or a friend or a boss or an employee, if I neglect my responsibilities, I add to other people's burden. I put increased weight on their shoulders and they end up having to pay the price for my unwillingness to take responsibility for what I need to take responsibility for. So one of the most loving things you can do is know what you are responsible for and take that responsibility seriously. It's an incredibly loving thing. And you need to see it as a loving thing because under the law, responsibility is just duty. That's all it is, obligation. That's why we, we don't like the idea of responsibility because we're so used to thinking of responsibility as obligation. But, but under the banner of this new way of living, this Jesus way, exercising your responsibilities is an act of love. And you've got to see it as such. It completely reframes your motivation, and it'll change how you feel about it as well. So ask yourself the question, what am I responsible for? Who am I responsible for? And how do I effectively take hold of those responsibilities and faithfully fulfill them? And number four, Paul says in verse six of Galatians six, that love is caring for and supporting your spiritual leaders and teachers. He says, nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share in all good things with their instructor. In short, what Paul is saying is that you should buy your pastor coffee. <laughs> right? Take good care of them. Make sure that they are looked after. Those who have responsibility to lead you and teach you, make sure that they are cared for. Just because they are spiritual leaders doesn't mean they have it all together. They also need encouragement. They also need support. They need affirmation. That, and they need material help and financial assistance. You know, that, that is why in part, we give into the life of our faith community. It's not just so that we can impact our community and keep the water and lights running. It's so that we can support those who have been called by God to serve us and to lead us in this house, right? And, and uh, we have some of the most beautiful, wonderful, humble pastors and leaders I have ever met. Pastor Dean and his wife Hilda are just two of the most sincere, most humble, most wonderful people who love us and lead us and serve us so well. And the team that they've gathered around them, people like Annika and Mary and Chitra and Pastor D, uh, uh, Pastor Gordon down in Beldivis, uh, Michael Rumendi, these are world-class people who are genuinely humble, beautiful servants of God. And because of what God has called them to do here inside this house, they don't get to have full-time vocations out there in the world. They don't get to earn income out in the secular world. They, they are full-time invested here. And so our responsibility as those who call this place home is to make sure that they are looked after and that they are well-supported and that they feel encouraged. So the next time you see Marco Romendi, buy him a coffee. The next time you see Pastor D, buy him a coffee. He's going to have coffee coming out his ears. But he'll feel loved and he'll feel supported. And that will be a good thing. All right. So love is showing generosity and kindness to our spiritual leaders. And then finally, number five, last but not least, Paul says in verse 10 of Galatians 6 that love is showing generosity and kindness at every opportunity to everyone everywhere. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good. To all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We spoke about this at length uh, right at the beginning of this series when we spoke about the call to do good. How there's opportunity all around us. We just have to see it and seize it. The opportunity to be a source of life and love and hope and blessing and generosity. Starting right here in the family of faith with the people that we worship with, the people that we do life with but then extending beyond this family of faith out into the community. And every single one of us is capable of being a channel, a conduit through which God's goodness and grace flows to others. So do good to all people everywhere as the opportunity presents. And friends, as we wrap up this series this morning, this gospel of grace that we've been talking about for the last four weeks is certainly good news. But it's not just good news because it tells us how to get to heaven. It's not just good news because it tells us how to come back in a right relationship with God. It's not just good news because it tells us how to secure our eternal destiny on the other side of this life. It's good news because the gospel of grace transforms the human heart. Because it changes us from the inside out. Because it reorientates our lives from being self-focused to being others-focused. It changes what we value and what we prioritize. And it makes us more like Jesus. And you know what I've discovered? 
after spending decades working with people, walking with people, getting to know people, I've discovered that the vast majority of people want to be a part of something that makes a difference in this world. But at the same time, they want to be part of something that makes a difference in them. Sure, they want to be part of something that's going to make the world better. They want to be a part of something that's going to make a a positive and eternal impact on this world. But they also want to be a part of something that's going to make them the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. The version of themselves that God has designed and desired them to be. I honestly cannot say that I've ever met anyone who deep down does not want to be better. More loving, more gracious, more patient, more generous, more responsible. Deep down, we all want that. And this is the good news of the gospel of grace. That as we fall in line behind Jesus, as we put our faith and trust in Him, as we submit to His wisdom, as we allow Him to lead us back in a relationship with God, not only do we have the assurance of our eternal destiny, not only do we have the assurance of life eternal with Him beyond this life, but we begin to experience the transforming, sanctifying grace of God that changes us from the inside out and makes us the people we desire to be, the loving, kind, compassionate, patient, responsible people deep down we all want to be. And boy, does our world not need more of that right now. Amen? So I want to invite you to just take a moment to bow your heads and to close your eyes. We're going to pray together. And before we do, I just want you to consider this. Because it's possible that you might be sitting here today and you have never really expressed faith and trust in Jesus. It's possible that you've never made a decision in your heart to bring your life under His authority and to follow Him and to trust Him and to put your faith in Him. You you might be in church today for the very first time or the very first time in a long time. You might have just tagged along with a friend or maybe a family member. Maybe you only come to keep your spouse happy. But maybe over the course of the last few weeks or maybe even the last few months, as you sit and listen to what we've been talking about and experienced something of the life of faith in this community, something in your heart is resonating with it and you know that that's what's missing from your life, this this relationship with the God who made you and designed you and brought you into this world with reason and purpose. Maybe that's what's missing from your soul. Knowing why you're here, having a reason to live, experiencing the love of God and the grace of God. Well, friends, the good news is that the Bible says so clearly that God has done everything necessary through the person of His Son, Jesus, to pave the way for you to come back into relationship with God, for you to know your Creator, and for you to live a life of purpose and meaning and significance. He has already accepted you. You just have to accept His acceptance of you. You just need to receive the gift. You need to say yes to the invitation. And maybe today for the first time in your life, that is what you are going to do. And I'm, I'm going to pray in a moment for you and I'm going to pray for all of us. But if that is you today, I want to encourage you as I pray to open your heart to God and just simply say to Him, Jesus, today I choose to put my faith and trust in You. Today I choose to bring my life under Your Lordship and Leadership. Today I choose to become a follower. I accept your acceptance of me. I receive your mercy and grace. And I ask you to lead me. Lead me into relationship with the living God. And as you pray that prayer in your heart, I guarantee you that God by the power of His Holy Spirit is gonna come and overwhelm your life. He's gonna fill you with His power, with His grace, with His goodness. And today will be a watershed moment in your life that you will never forget. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to gather like this, to open up your word, to explore the truth about what you have done in and through the person of Jesus. And Father, we're so grateful that we can sit here today as those who've been on the receiving end of your love and your acceptance and your kindness. And I pray for anyone who right now in this moment is reaching out to you in faith and trust and choosing to submit and surrender themselves to you. I pray that you would envelop them in your love, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would change them from the inside out, that you would bring them into your family, that you would make them a part of your kingdom, that they would know that today is the day that something shifted and changed in their lives. And today is the day that they began a new chapter in their story as they began to follow your son, Jesus. I pray that you would give them the assurance today that they are loved by you and that you have great intentions for their future. 
And I thank you that you will begin to lead them from this moment on. And Father, for the rest of us sitting here who have been on this faith journey for so long, we simply pray that you would cause us to grow ever deeper in love with your son, Jesus. Help us to see him for who he truly is and help us to know him so that we can represent him well in this world so that all might know that you are God and that you are good. And we ask it this morning in his precious, wonderful name. And finally, Father, as we go from this place, I pray your richest blessing over each and every one. We ask for your providence and your protection. We pray for your favor to rest upon our homes and our families and our children and our businesses. And pray, Lord God, that your goodness and mercy will follow us every day of our lives to the honor and glory of your name. And in Jesus' name we ask it. And everyone who agreed said, amen and amen. All right, God bless you, everybody. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, if you do have to uh, rush off, have a great week. Otherwise, enjoy some fellowship out in the foyer. Grab a cup of tea or coffee. And if you need prayer, come on down to the front and our team will pray with you. God bless you.